Uh, I'm Al Ortwig. I am president of the Payne Phelan District 5 Planning Council. Uh, and I'm extremely pleased that all of you are here tonight about such a uh, serious topic. I do want you to know that uh, the most recent incident happened a couple of blocks from my house. So this is not like an issue that is unknown to me. Um, first off, uh, I would like us to remember the family and, um, and others who have uh, experienced harm. Uh, so I would like us to take a moment of silence. If prayer is your thing, send a prayer to, the, um, to Ray uh, Winstrand, who's in the uh, hospital, um, or do just a silent message sending. So let's take a moment of silence. Thank you all very much. Now I would like to introduce our host for the evening, the pastor of the church here, Roger. Uh, thank you, Al, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm Roger Almendinger. I've been pastor here about six years. Uh, we meet here often, and I think that's a good thing. We're glad to have you here. Uh, it is a large and uh, complicated building. We host the Literacy Council's Open Door uh, Learning Center. There's four very diverse uh, congregations that worship in our space. Uh, Alley Shop is a free store offered out of here, and the Payne Maryland Partnership uh, is uh, housed here in its transition center. Uh, I should make some introductions of people who are here. Um, city council members, I notice um, Dan Bostrom is here. Uh, Amy Brenmon was here. I think I saw Amy in back, still trying to get in. Uh, Kathy Lanfrey, council president, is here. Uh, am I missing any other council members? Uh, we have county commissioners here. Which of our county commissioners are here? Jim McDonough is here. Uh, anyone else? Rafael Ortega is here. Thank you for being here. We have our county attorney, John Toy, on stage. Uh, we have some legislators here. I saw Tim Mahoney. Uh, Tim, can you wave? Uh, have you seen other legislators, Tim? Uh, Senator Fong Her. We have uh, received regrets from a number of our elected officials. Uh, Representative Lesh and Senator Marty uh, have sent in their regrets. Um, and uh, with that, I think I want to proceed into introducing the mayor. We are extremely fortunate to have uh, the mayor who is present with us this evening. Uh, he has demonstrated concern for this issue. And I'd like to turn the time now over to him uh, to speak in terms of making his comments. Mayor, Mayor Coleman. Thanks, Al. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. This is uh, an incredibly powerful statement about a community that cares, a community that wants better for uh, our neighborhood here, uh, a community that is uh, just concerned about what is happening on the streets of the east side of the city of St. Paul. Um, we did have an opportunity to just remember the victim of this last week's uh, senseless act of violence. But I also want to remember everyone that has been a victim of violence, particularly this last year. There have been a lot of our children, our brothers, our sisters of all races, of all ages, that have been victims of crimes. And, and we need to remember that this isn't about one incident. This is about a series of behavior. This is about acts that we will not tolerate in our community. This is about acts that no community should tolerate. It is really hard when you've invested your life into a community, when you've raised your family in a community, bought a house, gone to school, opened up a business, tended to your yard, gone to church in this community. To see the things that we have seen, particularly over the last couple of months, happening in the streets of the east side. 
And I can sit here and tell you all day long about how statistically things are better than they have been, but there is no statistic that will comfort you when you have been a victim of a crime, when your loved one has been a victim of a crime, when you have witnessed some of the acts that are occurring in the streets. What you need to know is that we stand together on all this. You have the top leadership of the city of St. Paul here. Not just elected officials that feel like they have to be here, but we have our department heads that are working in conjunction with all other folks in the community to say, what do we need to do differently? What do we need to do better? How do we make sure that these things don't get repeated? How do we make sure that there's not another victim of a senseless beating? How do we make sure that there's not another child laid to rest too early because of gun violence in our streets? When we come together, we can address these issues. They're not easy. But there are a lot of us and a lot of you that have worked for years to strengthen the east side, to build it up. Whether you've been on the district council or you've been as part of a church group, whether you've tutored or mentored a child, read to a child, helped somebody along, whether you just shop along the avenues here, all of those things add up to people that are invested in a community. And when people are invested in a community, we can change what's happening out there. You're going to hear a lot from the chief and from the county attorney about some of the strategies that we have employed and deployed over the last couple of weeks. But you need to understand this is not something new. This is not a reaction to what we saw last Friday or on the 4th of July or during the course of the summer. This is a part of a long-term pattern of trying to figure out how we get ahead of the curb on some of these youth that are committing these crimes, some of these gangbangers that are running around on the street causing trouble and taking innocent people along with them. The chief has worked very hard with his officers, using the best techniques he can. And, but sometimes they're running from one call to another to another. And it's hard to stay ahead of that curve sometimes. But what gives I know the chief strength, what gives me strength is looking at some of the community work and some of the community groups that are out there. The Youth in Transitions program, uh, trying to get kids steered out of gangs and into the right direction is an incredibly powerful program. Working side by side with our, with our folks in Ramsey County, working in our libraries, working in our, in, our, in our parks and rec building. It's not a coincidence that we're standing 100 yards or sitting 100 yards away from a new building that's rising up on the east side as a testament to a city that cares about all of its communities as a testament to a city that says we are a city of neighborhoods and all of our neighborhoods have to be strong, all of our neighborhoods have to be safe. I can't say it's okay to have it be nice and strong and safe over in Highland Park, but say that doesn't matter because on the east side, things are falling apart. I know what this is like. I, I lived in Frogtown for eight years. And I had summers where it was nice and the neighbors got together and you could walk down the street and feel like you were really part of a community. And there were other summers where one family moved on to the block, maybe was selling drugs or running kind of wild, and it totally changed how we felt about that community. Totally changed how safe we felt in our own home. I've heard those gunshots at night. I've seen victims lying on the street. I've been a victim of crime. And it does not feel good. And it doesn't want to make, make you want to invest in that community. We don't have it right, obviously. Last summer, we had a lot of success. We weren't perfect then either, but we didn't see some of the incidents that we had. What we're seeing the last few weeks and the last few months in the city is troubling. It's very concerning. And we know we need to do more. I've worked with the chief and with the county attorney, with our city attorney, to say, let's invest more resources immediately on the east side. Let's have more officers patrolling the east side immediately. Let's flood the east side and let's make sure that this ends. But let's take this moment as a community to unite and to redouble our efforts. Let's not separate. There are a lot of good people in this room that care about this community. We're all races, we're all ages. Some of us are new to the city of St. Paul some of us have been here for generations. Our strength is in uniting, not dividing. 
So it's tonight, it's our opportunity to hear from you a little bit, and I'm going to apologize because I'm going to leave in, in, a, in a little while. I, I have some other commitments, but I will be here for a while, and I do want to hear from you. And I want to just say to you that we, every member of this community, every member of my leadership team, every member of the police department is committed to making the east side and Frogtown and the north end and the west side and every part of the city a great place to live, to raise your family, and to be a part of a community. Look around you. Look at the strength in this room. Let's walk out of this room united and commit it to making sure that we fight to make the, same, the east side of the city of St. Paul as strong of a neighborhood as any other community in this state. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the mayor for that ter terrific address. Uh, we're going to be spending most of our time, I hope you know, getting uh, questions from you and getting some answers. So we're going to be getting to that shortly. Uh, first, though, I want to call up uh, Chief Tom Smith. Uh, he's going to provide a very brief overview of the Widstrand case, uh, and he's going to tell us uh, what the community can expect of the police and how we can all be a part of the solution. So, Chief. Thank you, Al. And thank you for everybody being here tonight. This is a testament of why I live in St. Paul, because people care. Now, I'm going to give you a briefing of uh, what happened in the last couple of incidents, not just Mr. Wigstrom, because there's been troubling incidents with what we call, it's kind of a national trend with flash mobs. But I want to tell you one thing. Regardless how we look, regardless where we worship, regardless what our race, ethnicity, or anything else in, this is a community issue. This is not about race. I want to I make that clear. I know people will have some questions, and we've got all sorts of experts tonight. Even I've brought a bunch of people from the police department that will be able to answer even more specific questions when you have them. But I want to let you know that we are working. We did a lot of good things last year on the east side, and we have some really good partnerships that we've continued to do. And you get three or four or five incidents of large groups of, I've heard, I can say, thuggish behavior. And that can ruin everything that we've done. And I'm not going to have it. I'm going to tell you that. We are going to put the resources. You'll hear about that in a second. But we've done a bunch of great things and partnerships. Last year, we started a new program. It was called Intel-led Community Partnership, Community Prosecution, and Community Policing. And guess what? It worked. We had very few incidents like this of large groups of individuals that come together at a moment's notice. We don't know when. Technology is a good thing and a bad thing where you can get 40 people to show up on a street corner because they use a device like this to tweet or whatever they use and to show up. By the way, I'm asking parents out here. That's one thing that I'm going to ask you to make sure that you look at the media tools, the social media tools that your children use. If you get one thing from me tonight, it does make a difference, by the way. That's a proactive thing of us working together. So we had a great year last year. We've partnered with 180 Degrees on the east side, Dick Gardell's run. In fact, we have 30 young men that were part of some large groups last year that we came in contact with, partnered with the county attorney, Youth in Transition, uh, uh, Save Our Sons, and they're still in that program this year. So they're not out in the street causing trouble. So I know we can do things that work on the prevention side, but make no doubt about it. I live in St. Paul. I'm the guy that used to call before I was a chief when there were problems like this for the two chiefs that I worked for. We will not allow this behavior to happen on the east side. We've put a lot of resources here on the east side right now, and none of you, I don't expect any of you, whether you live any part of the city, to um, have to take on or to uh, put up with this type of behavior, and I understand it. So now let me tell you a little about, about the two cases. You know, first in July, we had a young 17-year-old African-American male killed by another young 17-year-old African-American male. After we had a fight just blocks from here, of 40 to 60 people that my officers had to go into, uh, we stopped the original assault, arrested a couple people, some of that group came back, and that young man was tragically killed by gunfire. Shouldn't have happened. Now your police department made an arrest right away, and we have that suspect. The suspect's been charged. 
We work very closely with all, all our county partners here. Mr. Wigstrom, terrible situation. We already have an individual or a, a group of individuals that are fighting in the street. They came out of a house. Uh, there is 40 to 50 people fighting, and he is brutally beaten. I think all of you have read about most of the details in the paper. I'm not going to reiterate that. So there's already a fight in the street, and this individual then is severely beating, beaten. Um, and we all pray for him, his recovery. Uh, it's day to day, I'll be honest. He has a, a great family. We've, we've met with his family. Um, it's tragic. But what's really tragic is this is bigger than a police issue. This is about all of us. I can't stop a group of people from getting on a device like this and showing up all of a sudden in a certain neighborhood. We are going to send a strong message. But we need your help, and we've met with different leaders. Earlier today, I met with the African-American leadership in the city of St. Paul. We have the NAACP president here, Jeff Martin, African-American Leadership Council president, Tyrone Terrell. We have uh, uh, Reverend Devin Miller. We have Robert McLean from our Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission and also from the Urban League and other leaders that are here. Because we all agree, how, no matter how we look, we can't allow this behavior to continue. So here's what we're doing right now, and then I'll sit down. There's a lot more that I could say. I will sit down so that some of the other people can talk. We put 30 police, you have 30 police officers on the east side right now that don't have to respond to calls that can respond to this type of behavior right now. If we walk out of here, they're working. I know they're working, and they are a visible presence. That allows your police officers on the east side to go to the regular calls so that they don't have to run into a situation of 20 or 30 or 40 people. We've documented since uh, June 1st about six or seven of these incidents where they have happened. People just in the middle of the street fighting with each other. Many times the victims don't even want to cooperate with us. My thing is where are the parents and what the heck is going on? That's the biggest issue. But I can tell you that I've worked in prevention before and we've made things work. So we want to look at that. But the most serious offenders, we are going to arrest you. And all of us, from the leadership that you have here, from the African American community to others, we all agree no violence like this should be allowed to happen. And we have to arrest and go after those individuals that are perpetrating these types of crimes, and we will. So you have 30 officers. You have bicycle officers. I was just at uh, First Baptist Church. And you have bicycle officers. People are saying, Chief, we're seeing your bicycle officers on the east side. Visible presence. We're working with MTC, Chief John Harrington, my good friend, our former chief right here. He is helping us because a lot of this activity has happened around transit and bus stops. I'm just going to be honest with you. Transit and bus stops. So he is working with us very closely right now. Uh, we have Ramsey County Probation. Uh, we have uh, our mounted patrol officers. What I'm here to say, there's other resources as well. We're working very closely. You'll hear from him next, our Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, uh, also with our City Attorney Sarah Gruen, uh, to make sure that when we have charges, our officers are arresting people, that we're paying real close attention to what's going on right here and that those charges go through. So those are the things that we're doing right now, but it's a longer-term issue. I can't arrest our way out of this problem. I'm not going to tell you that I can. We will arrest people, but there's a bigger issue about why all of a sudden this year these flash mobs have started to show up, specifically in an area, I could tell you it's kind of from Earl all the way over to Mississippi and Arcade down to 7th Street. And even though serious crime is down in this area, I can show you the numbers. It doesn't matter. It's all wiped out because of what is happening. We will not put up with it. You shouldn't have to put up with it. I guarantee you, you'll see me here tomorrow night as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to have the police chief here, the mayor here, that's really terrific. Uh, next, we have County Attorney John Choi. Uh, John is going to talk about the general prosecution uh, process and the hate bias crime statutes. John. Good evening, everybody. I'm John Choi, and I'm your Ramsey County Attorney, and um, I wish that uh, none of us were here tonight because um, 
something very tragic, horrific, and horrible has happened uh, on our beloved east side in our community. And I remember when I first read the uh, details of this horrific act, uh, I was just appalled. And what hurt about it for me so much is the fact that uh, uh, Chief Smith talked a little bit about this, but we had invested so many things. We were you know, doing a lot of great things, and we had a great summer last year. But this summer, it's just not been working out. And this act that happened, it just ruined all of that. And, um, but with respect to moving forward, as the mayor talked about, I think it's very important. Uh, we're all here gathered as a community, and as we walk out of this room tonight, that we are together and that we are going to be a stronger community. Now, with respect to what happened uh, on the east side, um, with respect to those prosecutions, we have been presented by the police with five cases, and we have charged all of those cases out, one adult. There are four juveniles. Uh, with, with respect to um, three of those juveniles, I can't talk about the details of that because it's not public information. Uh, but I will tell you that from my perspective as the chief prosecutor, we will not tolerate this type of violence and we will find and we will, see, we will seek and we will find justice uh, for Ray and his family and this community. Um, so the, the criminal process is going to play out and uh, there's people here from my office uh, who are very dedicated to uh, ensuring that we have accountability and we send a very, very strong message. But moving forward, we have this incident and we're going to deal with it in the criminal justice system. But as a community, there are important things that we need to continue. We need to continue to working on figuring out ways to stop this type of behavior. And we talked a little bit about uh, the, the success that we had this past, the, the last summer. Uh, we're going to double our efforts in that particular area. I just had a conversation with uh, St. Paul Youth Services, and the chief talked about this. But I th really think one of the reasons why we had success last summer is that we were going out and finding parents whose children were out past curfew. That's what I think the important part of that is. And so we're going to redouble our efforts. St. Paul Youth Services has agreed. Uh, to continue uh, their work in a, an additional month. And so we're going to just go out and try to engage parents, and, and not in a criminal way, but to try to, in a way to find out what, what's going on and try to get them so that we can get some intervention going on. I think that's very, very important, that we don't lose sight of the fact that this is not all about arresting people and prosecuting people. I assure you we will do that. But it's also about, as a community, how we go about solving this problem, this problem of young adults, young kids who have nothing to do, who are out on the street corners causing problems. And we also have to send that really strong message because quite frankly what had happened uh, to Ray is pure evil and we need to abate that. So thank you. The next part of our process is to have you, you ask your questions. And if you have written um, your uh, questions down, that would be helpful. Uh, you should form a line at the second um, microphone back there. And Leslie will be um, uh, taking cards from people and getting people in order to speak. Um, I do want to, while we're getting ready to do this, I want to introduce Gene O'Connell. Is Gene here? Uh, Jean is the chair of the school board in St. Paul, and I want to be sure that Jean is recognized. Way in back. Okay, thanks, Jean. Are there any other school board members here that I missed? Another one, okay. Oh, Keith Hardy. Thank you, Keith. John Broderick's here? Okay, great. Uh, Keith lives in the area up near Maryland on this side of I-35, so we're glad that he's able to be here. Uh, we're going to also have a panel of people who are going to be ready to answer questions. They're, they're going to introduce themselves as they um, respond to questions, I think is the way it's going to work. Uh, so why don't we take the first question. My name is Rick Cobb. I own two properties over on Bush Avenue. I had 30 to 50 kids go into one of my vacant units and have a party. The police came after I started shooing them all out, 
They co congregated outside. The police made no arrest. They did a breaking and entry. I've got pictures of some of the people, but the police did nothing to discourage them from doing this to somebody else. I sure would like to know why. Sir, my name is Joe Neuberger. I'm the senior commander for the Eastern District, so the officers that responded report to me. I can't answer that question right now, but if you have one of the contact cards, I will get your information and I will find out. Uh, they should have. Um, I can't give you a good answer right now, and I would prefer not to try and just, you know, tell you something without any kind of factual basis. So if you know, I saw that you were sitting near the front here, I'll get your name and, and contact number and we'll make sure we find out why. Next question, please. My name is Linda Konachek, and I just want to bring up a kind of a partly a safety issue, and I see kind of kind of gangs and training coming through this area. I did draw a map. I'll drop off to the chief, and I've tried to let two staff of the police department and one of the heads of park know about this, but no one seems to have any concern about it. There's two brewery buildings on the other side of the police block across that Bruce Vento Trail. There's a smashed up uh, gate where the kids get onto a walkway of pipes over the trails about 30 foot drop there's no handrails and i'm concerned they're going to fall and get hurt and then when they get to the end on the rainy uh, part of the block um, at the dead end of rainy right up by the police station area um, then they have to kind of climb down and get on a real steep thing and come and bail up over the fence to come through rainy right by the police station so i'm drawing a map because i would like that fence that's collapsing in different places besides the gate is open and it does have a cheap piece of chicken wire hooked onto one side of the broken gate but it's not attached on the other side and someone could easily uh, pull that chicken wire off so i just wanted that it's a safety concern for the people walking on the pipes across the trail that might fall thanks Th thank you uh, for that information. And we do have folks from the, our Department of Safety of Inspections. We have Parks uh, and Rec folks here. Um, and so we'll make sure that they get this information. I, I, I ride that trail quite a bit, so I know, I know where you're talking about. And um, I, I, I do want to just say, though, I think one of the great things is as the Hams Brewery uh, is being reclaimed for jobs, uh, hopefully we can get all of that site uh, recovered and so there are no more empty buildings and, and pipes and, and places that kids are getting into because people are working there but we'll we'll yeah we'll work on getting that uh, that thank you next question hi my name is Kathy Kiefer and I live on the east side of Minnehaha um, my big biggest question is our officers are doing a great job but it doesn't seem like they're being backed up by the administration they're, they're trained to, to take these hoodlums down, but when they do this, they get reprimanded. And I don't think it's fair. They just, they need to have the authority to thump some heads and kick some butt. If that's what it takes to get this under control, that's what I'd like to see done. Okay, Kathy, thank you for your, uh, your comments, your concerns. We, as a police administration for the city of St. Paul, my, by, the, by the way, my name is Todd Axtell. I'm the assistant chief. Uh, we do take crime very seriously. And we, as you can see, by we have a lot of police officers here tonight in support of our community members because a lot of us do live in the city and we care a lot about this city. But the way we go about doing our business has to be in a way that's reflective of our community standards and we can accomplish we can accomplish the task of making our community safe by when we do have to use force it has to be reasonable it has to be necessary and it always has to be with respect and we can do that and we can do that in a way that we still lock the bad guys up. And I can tell you, as a police officer that used to patrol Payne Avenue, I know that we can lock the bad guys up and still do it with respect and within community standards. Thank you. Just a couple things, too. I, I want to be clear. We have more officers now in the city of St. Paul uh, than I think at any point in history. We've added over 38 officers. 
uh, not just uh, patrol officers, but we're going to add more sergeants. We have we have folks that are now uh, because of some of the investments that the chief is going to make, we're going to be able to free up some officers that are currently sitting behind a desk and they're going to get out on the street. Uh, we're going to add analysts to help analyze some of the data so that we can sense and, and detect patterns prior to that. But I also want to say, and it's a little bit uh, following up on, on uh, Assistant Chief Axel's comments, I've lived in this community all my life. And I think we're blessed to have one of the best police departments of any city in this country. And they do a good job. But one, of the, but one of the reasons why they do a good job is because they do have the respect of the community. And if they lose that respect because they're going around just thumping heads or beating people up for no reason, I will guarantee you the work that they do will become 10 times more difficult. That is not a strategy for success. That's a strategy for failure. Next question. I'm Pat Kiefer, I'm Kathy Kiefer's son. Just to reiterate, so in other words, the higher up is not gonna help out the officers out on the street. Is that what you're saying? Straight out. You know, I'm not exactly sure where this is coming from, and, and obviously uh, uh, when you have a large police department uh, that some people might have some different opinion, but I'll tell you this. I've been a cop here for 24 years, lived in the city all my life. I've always supported our police officers, always. Now, we do hold officers accountable. Sometimes officers make mistakes. I expect you folks to hold us accountable for our actions, but very seldom. I, I, I can't even think of it. It's such a small number of officers that are disciplined in the police department, so I'm not exactly sure where this is coming from, except to tell you again, as Assistant Chief Axtell said, we are responsive to the needs of the community. Uh, we have extra officers over here. We have more officers. We've got a good leadership team on the east side, and we have always supported our officers. So, And they have an avenue also to talk to us and to talk to me. I've been very open. So. I just want to let you know you've got a good police department. We do support what they do. I support what they do, and so do their supervisors. But thank you for that comment. Uh, Greg Copeland has the next very short question, I'm sure. Actually, I don't have a, don't have a question. I have a, a challenge to the chief. You know, you, you told us in your remarks that this all kind of started around June 1. I got to tell you, is it on? OK. I got to tell you, Chief, I had a, a, a riot that I reported on the first 70 degree day that we had in the Salvation Army parking lot where uh, Mo Allison was later killed uh, in uh, July. We didn't uh, have a meeting after that. Then the next 70 degree day, we had a riot in front of my home. I live at 612 East Cook Avenue, four houses off of Payne Avenue. The police department, I'll give you lots of credit, the guy showed up, they brought the horses. I think they had the helicopter in the air. They had uh, perhaps the dogs out. They had the street blocked off and the traffic going down my street. Uh, you know, my favorite number is 911. I, I get asked by drug dealers, I get asked by drug dealers why I always call 911. It happens to be my birthday. But it also happens to be your number. And folks, we have got to do a better job. And frankly, there's one other point I'd like to make is that uh, we need a longer term strategy. You know, we need a strategy with our children. We need to do some intervention and prevention work with our children. We need our school board to be engaged in doing something that is proactive, that is preventing yeah. people from joining gangs and not allowing this to continue. Let's, okay, let's let the chief respond. Well, Mr. Copeland, thank you for, for telling us that. And, and you know what we do, we, I mentioned those incidents, so you're absolutely right. And we have seen an increase this year. And that's why we're putting more resources here. Um, that's also why there are some things that have been going on we'll talk about later in the summer as well uh, as we continue to go on that hopefully will make the east side a safer place. We are continually looking at other strategies. Senior Commander Newberger and his staff are doing a good job. You know, when the police show up, I just want to tell people here, when you show up usually, and I've seen videos because we have in-car camera videos for our officers, um, to 30 or 40 people, as soon as the cops show up, a lot of them run. A lot of them run. They take off. They're everywhere in the neighborhood. I don't have 30 officers that can beat feet and catch everybody. Some of them haven't done anything. Some of them have. Some of them have actually stopped and challenged your officers. And that 
is not a good thing. And we need to arrest those people, and we have been arresting those people. But I agree with you that we have seen things that have happened this year. The incident you talked about, I spoke about earlier, um, absolutely that are going on, and that's why we are looking. I agree with long-term strategies. This is more than just about the police department. There need to be other strategies, whether it's with our schools and parks and record. We're working with all our partners, and I just want to make that very clear. Thank you. Uh, Greg, let's let Greg, please allow. No, Greg. No. Hi, my name is Diane Veal, and I stay at 594 Case. And I want to say that um, the kids over there, when I wake up in the morning, they're there in front of my house and they're on my porch. When I go to sleep at night, they're on my porch. And the police, they arrest them, so they say. But when they let them go and take them around the corner, they come back around. I call the police like the Sarge tell me, and all they do is take them around the corner, take, them, take their dope or whatever. When they're gambling, they take them and give them a ticket, let them go. So what's the purpose of that? Ma'am, ma'am, there's, there's a couple of things that we can do to, to help you immediately. We'll have our um, uh, crime prevention person come out to your house tomorrow. If we can get you to sign some paperwork that authorizes us to arrest without your being there for trespassing, we'll get that up because we've been, we've been, and we've been making those cases. The 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 um, Chief Axtell and Chief Smith both talked about it. There are some restraints that we have to follow. I mean, there's there's rules that we have to abide by, just like everybody else, as far as prosecution. So we'll increase the efforts. We'll do the best we can. But again, some crimes, we have to follow a process. Okay. The officer told my son that we already have a no trespass for anybody that does live there. And they said if they catch anybody there that does not live there, they're going to charge him with that. How's that going to, you know, go take effect of that? How can they charge him for that? When not, you know, can be held accountable for people that's standing out there that does not live there. If I understand your question, the officers believe that your son is inviting them over? Yeah, but, but how can he control people that's standing on the sidewalk when they're there 24-7? You can't control, he can't control people that just come standing in front of the building or walking up and down the street. Those people are there 24-7. Well, that, yeah, you're correct with that point. They, they can't arrest your son for trespassing on his own house, okay? That, that you just can't do that. Well, I'm telling you, they can't do that. Um, and we'll make, we'll step up the efforts. We've been working that whole case area from Payne um, uh, West, and we'll make sure that we pay special attention to your house. Next question. My name is Dale Croc, and my grandson in the second row up there was jumped when he and his friends went to the fireworks and they were coming home and there was 20 to 30 of them. In the process of that, Jesse ended up going to the hospital and he was petrified. I could see his stomach heaving when I got to the hospital. But worse than that, my daughter was riding with me and the police officers that answered the phone when we were trying to find out anything were rude to her and they had the same attitude that some of those gang members had. Yeah. Worse than that, uh, I gotta take my glasses off. <laughs> um, there should be something in the newspaper that says what the police are allowed to say and not allowed to say because we could not get any, any information. And I have one further thing to add. And Leslie behind me is going to uh, talk about the same thing. So, okay. So far, after three phone calls to the mayor's office, I have not yet received a call back. Just about the same response that we got from the police department. The police department have not contacted us yet, the one, the investigation unit. Well, uh, Dale, I, I, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm really sorry that uh, your grandson, Jesse, has been a victim of a crime. Um, but we do have a process in place. First of all, when you call, when you call 911, 
those are not, just so everybody knows, those are not police officers answering the call. That, that call goes to Ramsey County Dispatch Center and their civilian employees. So that's a, that's a point that we will certainly uh, document on your case. We'll take a look at that and we'll make sure we communicate with that, the Ramsey County uh, Communication Center. As far as follow-up goes, uh, we do have our investigative units here tonight. We'll make sure that uh, uh, that is followed up on uh, immediately. I'm sure that uh, our investigators are working out. We have Assistant Chief Martinez back here today. I know that uh, uh, he is uh, listening loud and clear as well. So um, again, I'm sorry that that happened. We will uh, follow up on that for sure. Okay, this has been since the 4th of July. All right, I think we should move to the next questioner. We're going to have to move a little faster here. We've used up about half of our question time and we have a long, long line of people who want to ask their questions. So be very concise in terms of putting your question before us. My name is Leslie Moore. I live about five blocks from here. I was a victim of a crime. Actually, my family was a victim of a crime. We were beat, dragged across the street, this happened in May, the beginning of May. Where's my justice? Nobody made a big deal about it. I get the police report and it makes me look like I'm a criminal. I have not committed a crime. I've lived in this neighborhood for 18 years. I've vested myself in this neighborhood. I work in this neighborhood. I, I wanna know what the police are gonna do to make me trust you so that you, if I need help, you're gonna show up to my defense and make sure that I don't get killed. Ma'am, I'd hope that, and, and we've got a lot of people here tonight, that we will be able to get the incident that happened to you so we can absolutely follow up on. I want to tell people something here, for the most part. Some people are happy with our service from time to time. We're a big city, big department. But I will tell you this, if you get a hold of the right person, I want to tell everybody this here, if you're not happy with the service you get from the person you talk to, then you call back and you talk to one of my command staff. And I guarantee you that someone will call you back. I guarantee you that someone will take action. But you have to call the right person. Now, we got into before, ma'am, you called, and you called the Emergency Communication Center, and you said that people were rude to you. Um, but if you have investigative questions, we're going to take a look. That Those calls have to come to the right person in the police department. We don't know who to call. We exactly. Exactly. And Right, and 911 center should be able to tell you that, but I, I want other people to be able to speak, but we want to get both of your information so that we can see where your cases are and what has gone on here so that we can help you. Excuse me, Chief. Uh, I think some of you have had individual um, issues that, that the uh, staff aren't going to be able to respond to, uh, but I think they do want the information so that they can follow up. So if you can put the information on a card about a case that we can't respond to now, uh, they'll uh, agree to get back to you. I have a request of the Chief. Is it possible that someone in uniform could take folks' information? We do have cards, but if there was some place where someone, people could just get the information tonight rather than have to make a call tomorrow. Can I just say, we have Jesse's information. I will. Yeah, Al, this was just for ex expediting things? Yep. We'll we'll Who can officers. record people's concerns? Uh, we'll have We'll have officers, myself included, outside in the area, and we'll stay till the last person gets their information passed on to us, and I guarantee you, you will get some kind of response from us. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Steve Schaus. I'm a 15-year resident of the East Side. My wife is a 40-year resident of the East Side. Uh, we've seen a trend of, of non-response uh, to calls in our neighborhood. And I feel like if it's on Payne Avenue, then they'll come. But if it's on Edgerton, where we live, north of Maryland, maybe they'll show up in 45 minutes. Maybe they won't. We've had cars get rear-ended. We've had fights going on outside of our house at 1 o'clock in the morning. Multiple calls from our neighbors as well as myself. And my wife, nobody comes. No police come at all. 
So I, I respect that you have a lot of police officers and you have a lot of things that you need to take care of, but you know, part of this trend is if, if kids don't see any, any sort of police response to anything that they do unless they're on Payne Avenue in front of the Salvation Army, then they're going to get more, uh, more aggressive and do more of these things. Thank you. Thank you. Th there's two things immediately that I, I would ask you to do is when you call, you can tell the call taker you want to see the officer. They will respond and they will come see you. If you don't get a response for some reason, you call back and you ask to talk to one of my supervisors. All right? Now, the, the, the other piece of that is, and, and the chief alluded to it, um, Ramsey County Dispatch handles the triaging of calls. And I'm not trying to, to uh, push off on another agency, but there is a hierarchy of priority of calls, and it goes into a pending queue, and they're dispatched in the order uh, of priority, and then the next order of receipt. So if it's a, a crime in progress, uh, accident with injuries, it goes to the top of the pile, and if it's a property damage accident, it could well sit up to 30 minutes. So there are some administrative issues because we've only got so many folks to handle so many calls at a time. Um, but with regards to the first part of it, you should see somebody, and if you want to see them, they will be there, and if not, if you talk to me when we get outside, I'll give you my cell phone number. Next question. Hi, my name is Jean. I live on Lawson and Arcade. I'm a 40-year resident and multi-generational in the Twin Cities. My son had a gun stuck in his face during a robbery of T-Mobile at Seeger Square. My neighbor had four tires removed off of his truck while it was parked in the alley. My car was just robbed. Where are you? You say that you're here, you're not. What about holding the storefronts responsible that let these kids congregate? What are you doing about making the parents responsible for letting their children roam the streets? What about our children that don't feel safe in their own neighborhood? What are you gonna do about those parents that let these kids run the streets? I'm a responsible parent, why aren't they? Gene, thanks for your comments. Um, as far as the, the parenting issue goes, we do work as much as possible with our uh, non-governmental agencies to uh, partner with uh, the, uh, youth initiatives. We have several uh, across the city, including uh, programs like the YWCA Junior Police Academy. We try to get kids involved in after-school activities. We also understand that we really can't and do it alone. It is a community effort. We need those calls to keep coming into the police department. We all have to take ownership in this community because uh, with uh, 600 officers, we, we simply can't solve it on our own. So we're asking for your help. We're asking for your partnership. I see the passion. I feel the passion. And, and we do hear you loud and clear. Thank you. My name is Danette um, Alrich. I live. Can you even hear me? Al Ortwig, could you ask people to maybe quieten it down so people can be heard? Yeah, uh, Danette has the next question. Danette is uh, active in the Westminster Case uh, Block Club, and I appreciate her asking the next question. Yeah. You haven't heard it. Um, no, I. So I live on Case. I live in the Lower East Side of St. Paul. I've lived there 13 years. Um, I love my neighborhood. I think it's awesome. I. I love everything about the east side except the crime. Um, I have a childcare business in my home, so I have a double effort to keep things safe and report and call on everything. And my thing is, I have to drive up case, say we go to the YMCA, and there is a section, and you guys um, referred to it, but um, between Payne and Edgerton on case, um, past the Wilder 
on Park. There is, Diane was just talking about it, the woman who said these people camp out on her um, her porch. I took the number down on the way here, 594 and 588 Case. She lives at 594. These aren't drug dealers in her porch. They are just people that are loitering. I have reported it. I put it on the Facebook, Eastside Facebook page. I have called District 5. I've called the police The at 588. And I'm sorry if anybody lives there, but it's a drug house. And it's like constant. What I'm, I don't understand how somebody can rent a home. You buy a home, invest. Where are the landlords? Why aren't they being held responsible for what they bring into my neighborhood? Well, no, I, I appreciate, but I, I do want to say, because other uh, people may not know some of the things that we're doing, particularly to go after problem properties and problem landlords. We do have our folks uh, from inspections here. Uh, several years ago, under the leadership of Councilmember Bostrom and, and Councilmember Lantry, uh, we went to a registration system so that... Is it, she's, yeah, she wasn't on the council yet, but I know she's... Amy Brenmon is, is... We all love Amy. But... <laughs> Again, I, I just want to say that we, we're really going after. We're, we're trying to step it up. It's one of the things that we're doing is trying to get out and inspect more of these properties uh, to go after where there's violations, to remove um, the certificate of occupancy when we can do that. If there's, and, it's, and it's not just active drug dealing, but really going after unsightly conditions. There are a lot of places that we need to, to step up our efforts. But I think it's one of those, you know, the old broken windows theory, which is you, you go after places that, uh, that aren't being cared for because if they're not being cared for a lot of bad things in, that can come after that but that is uh, you know to net, uh, your, your participation in the block clubs a lot of people have come up to me in the last couple of weeks and said you know what can we do uh, I hope that you're engaged in block clubs I hope that you're getting to know your neighbors I hope that you're getting to to, to let us know and be proactive on that and, and we're going to continue to work on it you have you have a lot of folks in the city um, but I wanted I wanted to say and, and this is kind of where we need to step it up because uh, of the challenges that we're seeing right now on the east side is that I, I want every one of our department directors to put in you know to, to really work extremely hard to go after these properties right now uh, where we're seeing these problems come from I truly believe that this is a, this is a small handful of, of folks that are causing the biggest problems, and if we can if we can get them, get the landlords that are allowing it, get the get the uh, the families that aren't watching off for their children, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know we need to let people know. You can either take the the highway uh, and 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 you know go to school and do what you're supposed to do and learn and behave, or you're going to go to jail, and 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 as a parent, you're going to we we do have, you know we can't. There's not a crime for a parent if your child is misbehaving. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, yeah. We'll talk, we have a couple of our legislators here, we might wanna, we, but the, the fact of the matter is we, we are working very hard and we're gonna step up those efforts. Could I have the DSI staff uh, raise their hands so that we know who to go to? Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so that if you have questions about that kind of an issue, uh, please check in with them. Uh, we do, again, I would say have limited time. I would ask people to please focus on uh, the specific incidents that we have staff here to address. Uh, so please try to frame, frame your questions in terms of the specific incidents, and uh, then we will um, uh, we can still answer other questions individually later, but let's use the expertise that's here. Christian, you're next. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Schweitzer. I'm a uh, resident of, of Eastside, and I'm also a member of the Payne Family Planning Council. Uh, and I have, I have a question for everybody up there on the dais, and that is uh, the worst of these incidents, if I'm to believe what I read in the newspaper, are surrounding uh, uh, some hangers-on, these young kids that are hanging around with an actual criminal gang. Uh, and I want to know why that gang is being allowed to run around pain and case for months and months. You should know who they are. I want to know why aren't they being tracked? Why aren't they being arrested? Why aren't they being prosecuted? I understand you got limits, but we are uncomfortable on that street, and these knuckleheads in that criminal gang 
who are inspiring these other kids to misbehave in our neighborhood, they need to be tracked, and I want to know what you're going to do to break that gang up. That's a great question, and I want to tell you one thing for sure. And I, and I know that we have uh, some of our gang unit here uh, tonight, including our gang unit commander. We have arrested a lot of those individuals already, and there are more people to be arrested. I don't disagree with you, sir, that people that uh, are mentoring people into bad behavior need to be taken off the street. Number one, we do have to have charges so that we can make them stick and work with our county attorney or city attorney so we can arrest them. I can have my gang unit commander come up here and tell you the number of people that we have arrested. Many times they're replaced by someone else very quickly. It's a larger issue, but we are continuing uh, with our gang unit to make arrests and arrests specifically here on the east side, and we will continue to do that. But again, these gangs, these flash mobs are very mobile. Um, so they don't all live on the east side. Uh, some of them, we've even worked with Minneapolis, and we usually don't have a lot of interaction between our different groups. Our cities have different challenges, but we know that some of our group is going back and forth with Minneapolis people. We're aware of that. Our gang unit's tracking it. We have made arrests, and we will continue to do so, and I think you will see even more um, very shortly. Next. Good to see you again. Hello, Al. Uh, my name is Ron Grimm, Eastside resident, Payne Phelan area. Uh, there's not anybody on the dais who can answer my questions, and I'm a little upset about that because it's about the schools. I want to know what, what the schools are going to be doing. I want to know what the schools are going to be doing. What the schools are going to be doing to make our kids safer and, and helping them. I mean, making that transit back and forth to schools. I mean. And I'm surprised that this, nobody from the school board is up there. Uh, and I, if you, if you're, you're the chair of the school board is Jean. Are you still here? Uh, if Jean wants to respond, uh, we'd be happy to hear a comment from the chair of the school board, Jean O'Connell. You don't want her. So I, um, you know, the we we know that parents are concerned about safety and getting to to and from school. Um, this year, rather than put money in the bank um, as we go to closer to closer to home schools, we've gone to transporting kids who live more than a half a mile from home rather than a mile, knowing that there are safety concerns. Um, and I think that we are open to all kinds of ideas. And if community members want to help us in, in helping kids walk to school, um, we are more than, more than interested in making sure that those things happen. We have op uh, safety officers in our buildings. We have one of our principals here. But we are very concerned about safety, just as all of you are. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Mr. Broderick, for coming up. I think we'll go to the next questioner now. Hi, and let's try to keep them focused on these specific incidents. Sorry. Sure. My name is Mary Beth Redmond, and I moved in on, on to Payne Avenue just six years ago. Um, I have just a couple things. I have, first of all, I've, I raised five kids as a poor single mom in St. Paul. It can be done. Um, <laughs> one of my, my son is an officer, and I'm quite proud that he's a St. Paul officer because because there are good people to mentor him. We don't want our police officers having to behave like animals towards anyone. We wouldn't want them treating human beings like animals. And so I'm very proud that he has the people he has to work with. <coughs> Two, I have worked in the St. Paul schools for 20 years at Central High School. I have to say, your schools, your principals, your teachers <coughs> are your partners, but there is only so much they can do when so many of these issues come from parents. So again, I would say perhaps there's not laws about parents, but of, we have all the youth intervention services. What about parent intervention services? <coughs> Where are those resources for parents? <laughs> and third, just one more thing. This is a good one. <laughs> there are wonderful works being done. The Neighborhood Stabilization Program, 
I'm looking to sell my house on Payne Avenue. Every day for the past two weeks, we read about the terrible thing that happened on Payne Avenue. Very difficult to sell your house. I'm not selling my house to move out of the neighborhood. I'm selling my house to hopefully move into one of the neighborhood stabilization houses that are in this neighborhood. Wait a minute. The Star Tribune reported on the neighborhood stabilization program. Where is our media? Where is St. Paul Pioneer Press talking about the good things happening on the east side? I can tell everybody I see how great it is to live on the east side, and they all laugh at me. Next question. Yes, my name is Greg Murphy. I live on Dale Street North. Uh, I have a really bad continuing problem with the rental property next to me. And here's the kicker. It's owned by Ramsey County Deputy. He lets his 23-year-old son screen the people in there. Uh, and this is not minorities. This, these are white kids from uh, 18 to 25. I've been threatened with bodily harm the last two weeks. I've had garbage thrown at me and hit me. And I don't get to sleep until 2.30. I'm working with Amy Brendamont. Thank you very much. Code enforcement. You're going to be hearing from me. It's Greg Murphy. I'm on the 1100 block of Dale Street. <laughs> One of the officers that responded this week, thank God, uh, when you make a complaint, I've had people threaten me come over, and that happened last week. And one of the gentlemen, the St. Paul police officer with the white shirt on and striped uh, tie came, talked to her. Uh, I'd like to see something done here. This is absolutely ridiculous. As a veteran, I've had it with this. And it's time maybe to get out of this town. Thank you. Anything? Next question. Hi, I have like a comment. Um, I've lived on the east side my whole life, born and raised Woo! here. Um, the problem is, is that uh, for the la since like July 4th, there's a house that's been targeted across the street from me that's been shot at three times. The recent was Monday evening. My daughter and myself were out in the front. The kids came up the street. The car went, they were looking for this certain car, and they shoot at them right in front of us. <coughs> Wouldn't even maybe from here to you. And it's like they're blatant. They don't care. It's like they come by there looking for them daily. I haven't seen them since Monday, though, but I want to catch them. I want to catch them because that's ridiculous, and it's pissing me off. <laughs> Seriously. And you should be ticked off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was politically pissed, or I guess I can say that here. Um, Ma'am, thank you. I want to tell something to everybody that's here tonight, please. You've got people that are here in our police officers. If you have a problem property next to you, because a lot of what we're talking about tonight has to do with properties, it has to do with some other social issues, but if you have properties, we want to hear about it. Um, and please, and I guarantee you somebody will respond to your problem property complaints and to our earlier question, and I didn't have even some of the numbers, but my gang, one of my gang unit sergeants came up here and said, with some of the recent is incidents on Payne Avenue, that even at Pain and Case, uh, Pain and Geranium, they've used Facebook. Some of these young people are actually posting very graphic things on YouTube where they're assaulting each other. Uh, and we have taken that through our gang unit because they are very, I mean, I'm working them to death. Um, and they have taken that information and actually received charges of riot from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office because they've been able to call through and have to look at that social media. That's very time consuming and we have to find it first. That's why I'm asking for other people to help us with that too when you come across that to contact somebody, the St. Paul Police Department gang unit and we have those people that are all here this evening. So six people were just charged in that case in July because of we being able to pull up what they posted on Facebook. So I want people to know that. We announced that we wanted to prioritize the local voices of people in District 5. So um, if people, if you don't live in District 5, you live in St. Paul, you live elsewhere, we'll let you speak, but we really need to hear from the residents. That's what this meeting's for. Thank you very much. My name is Tim Holden, and I'm running for St. Paul Mayor. No, 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 no. No, no, no I want to no. just say something real quick. The reality is Seriously? Chief, Chief no. Tom Smith. No. Tom Smith, no. for one reason. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. No, this is... I, I'm here to. I'm here for one reason. Our parents need to be held accountable. Our parents, I think, need to be. Tim, held accountable. I think people are asking you to uh, respect. You, we're we're asking. I want to say I'm very sorry for to Ray, to Ray, the gentleman that was assaulted. This is a tragedy. The gentleman that was assaulted. Nobody has been saying anything about him. I feel tragic for the guy who was assaulted. I also feel that you know what? The police 
need to hold the parents Lisa. accountable. Okay. We need to hold the parents accountable. All right, Tim, that's enough time. Mr. Holden, Mr. Holden, we'll go to the next speaker. I'm a resident. Uh, All right, let's give the next question our attention. Will y'all hush down, please? I got something to say. Y'all be quiet for a minute. All right, I live on 713 Magnolia. I'm originally from Brooklyn Park, moved in with my wife. We've been here for two years. In the two years, my car's been broken into three times. Subwoof was taken once, so I quit playing my music loud. It broke into my car again. Recently, they've been running up on my roof between me and my neighbor's house to the point where there's indentation on my roof. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I don't expect the cops to do no more than what they're doing because it takes me 30 minutes to get a response anyhow. I'm a registered gun owner. Now, I ain't trying to shoot or kill nobody's kid. But if you come into my house or my property, I'm going to shoot. And the last thing about I got to say, it ain't all about violence. Yes, the parents need to be uh, charged for stuff that they're doing, but people got to take care of their own. You can't depend on nobody else to take care of your kid but you. It takes a village to raise a child, but if the parents don't individually take care of this kid, we'll be back here next year talking about the same thing. Hi, my name's Harriet. I'm a new resident. I just moved in. I'm on Arcade and by Arcade in Maryland. I'm going to be honest. When I was looking for houses, I didn't look on the east side. I'm from Detroit. I didn't want trouble. But I found this great, and I'm, you know, I've been held up three times, beaten. It's all happened to me. So, but what I want to say is this. I'm a teacher, and I've been a social worker, and this is really what I think. You know, and please don't shoot anybody's kid. You know, I, I, I walk in the classrooms. I could tell you. I walk right in a classroom, and I know who's going to be in trouble. I've worked with kids that long. But here's something I saw on my own little street, my one little block. There's a family there. The father is not mentally capable of raising a child. He isn't. He's not a bad person. He's just not capable. And the mom's not really all together. So I've seen people in the neighborhood, people are helping the kids. It's a community. We're helping. We talk to the kids. These are kids that are going to be in gangs. That's OK. So let's just be a community volunteer and work with the little ones. Let's get to them before they get into a gang. Let's try to keep our questions focused on the panel of experts that we have here and the response to the incidents involved. Next questioner, please. I have the microphone. My name is Joseph Baltruconis. I do a lot of volunteering here on the east side. It's very apparent that we have a crime problem here and perhaps a very serious gang problem. We have a rec center. That a miracle center that's going up at Payne and Maryland. But how many rec centers did we have to close in order to get this one rec center? We can spend $10 million on polar bears. We can spend $10 million on gorillas and apes. We can spend millions of dollars on a Como pool. We can spend millions of dollars to remove contaminated soil from a second-rate ballpark that's going up. And how many millions just to build that ballpark? My point is... Did you have a question for the panel? Yes. Why? Why? Why is the east side a budgetary constraint and not a budgetary priority? I asked for a few hours for a rec center, and they told me budgetary constraints. I have another point, too. No, no. Well, let, me, let me just speak to that, because there are a lot of folks in this room that have worked many, many years to get investments on the east side. We saw it with the, uh, with the uh, Phelan Boulevard, uh, and we've seen, as a result of that, we've seen new housing going in. We've seen Kendall's Hardware Store, that is uh, one of the best new uh, businesses in town. 
We see Ward 6, which is you know one of the best restaurants in the Twin Cities. Uh, we've seen, as a result of uh, the Phelan Boulevard, we've seen jobs come in on the east side at Health Partners. We've got the new jobs coming into Ham's Brewery. We've got a lot of investment. And I don't think that there's any better, I don't think there's any better example of the investment than the building that is going up. Because people have said they, they w you know, we need an immediate response to the challenges that we're seeing and you're gonna, and you're, you're getting it. More officers, more enforcement, uh, sweeps, working with probation, tougher charging, all of those things. But all of us know that the long-term solution, as the woman that was a social worker had, had stated, working with these kids from the early stages, getting them into buildings where they can learn how to read, getting them into buildings where they can form relationships with trusting adults, getting them into buildings where they, where they can get a bite to eat after school, and they can see that there's a different path. And that's the kind of investment, $14 million worth of investment on the east side on that block alone, in conjunction with great partnerships, including the members of this church, including, uh, in including a lot of community groups and the district council and all kinds of folks. This man to my right has spent a long time living on the east side, and I'm gonna tell you how long Council Member Bostrom has been on the east side, because he gets sensitive about that. <laughs> but, but we used to have a saying when he was president of the council, we can't adjourn until we've given a million dollars to the east side. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we're continuing to invest, but we're investing smarter. We don't want just buildings that are sitting there empty. We want buildings that are filled with life and filled with resources for our children and have the best tools available. That's what we're doing across the street and that's what we're doing across the east side. Next question. And keep the questions focused again on the incidents we're trying to address. Hello, my name's Tina. As you all know, I am the parent of one of the kids that is being charged. And I would like to respond to the comment that the police chief did make. You said, where the heck are the parents? The parents do be at work, which that's where I was when this did take place. I was at work. When I leave my house, my kids are at home. When I'm at work, if my son leaves the house, I don't have no control of that. And at the same time, I've also been a victim of crime in St. Paul, where a person came into my house, took my kids from their bedrooms, locked them in one room, put my mom in another room, locked them in a room. Police came, found the man in my house, all my stuff in his car, and this man was still released. So, yeah, I done had a few occasions with St. Paul police. Yeah, they're really rude. Um, they're, oh, my God, I just don't even know where to start, but... <coughs> We sitting here judging, um, y'all say to have respect, they cut sitting here calling these kids hoodlums and all this stuff. Okay, some kids, some kids do fall victim to the wrong, like I say, it's older people out here. It's, in, in this case, it's like a lot of adults that's involved with this stuff that's luring these younger kids. And then they're luring these younger kids. Like I said, my prayers go out to the family. I feel very sorry. If my son did have something to do with this, he will be responsible for his actions, yes. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. District 5. We appreciate your being here. Thank you for your presence. Hi, I'm Scott. Been born and raised in St. Paul. Just bought a house in St. Paul. I'm 33. Uh, I feel like the media is 97% responsible for this thing here. I feel like the media is 97% responsible for this. I have heard for one month at least about the two Minneapolis white cops that were racist. A, a direct hit, white and racist, and they were being racist, this, that, and the other, every single day for one month now. And all of a sudden, things like this are happening. These kids are getting drunk, getting programmed to hate the white man, and some innocent guy walking through the east side, didn't know about this hood. He, he shouldn't even be here, really, but he was. And and I, I feel like the little kids, that the, the little gangster guys that did it have been programmed for some reason, maybe to take our guns away from the American people. And I just, okay. and the media has- Thank you for your comment. We appreciate your yes. comment. Next yes. questioner. Hi, my name is Garnetta. I'm also a friend of Tina's, and I'm. But my question is this: You guys say it's the law, the curfew. What are you guys doing to enforce the curfew? You know, since uh, May 1st, 
We've had over 100 people on the east side, young people, that have been picked up for curfew. In fact, that was a program that John Choi and I uh, embarked on last year with our officers that worked so well. Um, but 100 this year so far, then they go to the Youth Service Bureau. There are a lot of other things we talked about before, social issues. Actually, last year, we actually, through this program, the young people picked up. We had somebody come and deal with their parents to address just what you said and the woman before. We decided to try something different because a lot of the parents were working, didn't know what their children were involved with, didn't know their children might be involved or being recruited into a gang. We had great success. We want to mirror that, but this year the criminal activity is trumping. In other words, a very violent activity has trumped what we've been able to do in that area. But 100 citations since May 1st, 100 young people have been picked up in the Eastern District for curfew violations. And we ask you all, if you see people, again, there's 30 kids, I don't have 30 cops to run after all of them. I'll tell you an event just happened two weeks ago, there were 30 girls, absolutely, that were there. They walked right by, in fact, ran by the Eastern District Police Station, and we were able to detain seven to nine of them, and that was it. The rest of them were gone. Next questioner. Again, try to focus on the issues before us. Hi, my name is Laura Thompson, and I hear a lot of people talking about uh, their kids, your kids. You know, these are our kids, all, all of our kids. You ask them where the parents are? I mean, we live in a country that incarcerates 25% of the incarcerated population in the world. So some of those parents, they're just not around. And then you got single parents that are doing the best that they can. Some of them maybe working two or three jobs. They're not home at night because they're working restaurants or they're working health care. You know, it takes a community. So I suggest instead of all this finger point, maybe people start thinking about, hey, what can I do? How can I get involved with my church, with my community, with my school, to like do something proactive and start asking these guys what they're doing aside from just arresting people. What are you doing long term to grow flowers instead of weeds? Next question. Hi, I'm Abraham Morrell from, uh, I'm, uh, I live off of Brainerd. And uh, well, last year I had an incident with a police officer that came to my house and I was asking my kid to do the dishes and he uh, didn't want to and he just talked back to me. And the officer ended up uh, coming in and arresting me and throw me down to the ground and put me in jail. And it broke my whole family up. So I, you know, now I'm trying to sell my house and trying to sell everything, but nothing happened to that officer. And he didn't do the right thing. He didn't come and talk to me. He just threw me in jail. So that broke my family up. Now you're going to have a problem with my kids because they're not getting raised by their father. And what are you guys going to do to to make sure your officers do the right thing instead of doing the wrong thing and breaking up families instead of holding them together. All right. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we, we do pride ourselves in the St. Paul Police Department of being uh, professionals and responsive and try to provide the best quality service. When members of our audience, members of our community have uh, an experience with a police officer that they feel is not up to the standards of the St. Paul Police Department, we ask that you reach out to a, a couple uh, different avenues you have within the police department. Our internal affairs unit investigates police misconduct. They do it thoroughly. They do it well. We also have the Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission community members that uh, look, look at these cases uh, not within the police department. So we do have checks and balances. We try to maintain a positive uh, police force, and we do have those avenues. Please call us if you feel that you've been uh, uh, received less than adequate police service. Thank you. Hi, Next. my name is Lily Cooksey, and I live in the 1300 block of Burr Street, right near the ballpark, the dog park, and the soccer field. I never see a squad car in that neighborhood unless it's a local domestic. I want to know why, and I'm asking the chief that personally, why? And also, I have a house that's right across the street from me, 1364 Burr Street. 
that they lived in the house exactly one month before the gang task force was in there raiding the place. That was two years ago. They are still there. They've had Ramsey County Sheriff go in and raid the place. Why are they still in that house? It's a rental unit. It needs to be gone. And another thing, if the gangs are flooding the east side, why don't the police flood the east side? Well, your last question first, comment first. The police are flooding the east side, and uh, they are here. I think we talked about that earlier on, um, and you will see them. Uh, your question about the uh, soccer fields or the rec center, I, I want to tell people something. We've got 10 school resource officers. This summer, they're all assigned to rec centers. So maybe they don't wear a traditional police uniform. So I can't answer that question specifically, ma'am, but the senior commander here from the east side, I'm sure we will make sure that we follow up to see as one of our school resource officers assigned there. We did that on purpose to interact with our kids, to interact with the young people. And then finally, on the property, we'll take that information and we'll have to follow up with you on that and we'll be able to run that address. The uh, panel has stayed longer than um, they had agreed to stay and so I know we're moving beyond their time limits. Um, if you have uh, individual situations that you want to ask questions about, I would ask that you uh, write those down and approach individually. Uh, we maybe can take two more questions yet. Um, okay, take it. Go ahead with the next question. I just wanted to ask a very specific, very specific. Okay, let's take the next questioner. I'm here for my disabled mom who couldn't be here, who lives north of Maryland on Bradley. That's where I grew up. I grew up on the east side here. Um, she has a lot of trouble with groups of people wandering in the alley between uh, Bradley and Bert, and I'm sorry, Bradley and Jesse. And I don't think that, you know, because it's north of Maryland, I think it's perceived as a little bit more safer because you got Brainerd that cuts it off and everything like that. So I'm, I'm here to ask for a little bit more patrolling in that area. And then also, um, I personally went to the Gang Gun Strike Force webpage uh, last month to see if I could contact somebody because I had questions about gangs myself. How do I recognize gangs? Am I, you know, m mislabeling people as being in a gang? And I emailed the person who was listed as the contact person, and he emailed me back and said, "I haven't been in that post for two years." He said, "I'm not going to pass the buck. Please call me." And that's great, Paul. Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't know his I don't know his last name, but um, yeah. Exactly. So that was great. But uh, if you could update the website so it's more visible as to what we can do or how we can get in touch with the gang task force, that'd be great. I think your request has been uh, acknowledged. Next question. Hi, my name is Pam Tollefson. I've lived here all my life, 52 years, maybe longer than Mr. Bostrom. Um, <laughs> and my parents live behind me on Brainerd Avenue, and I'm on Burr where she was just talking about. My concern is only right now the gang, the ham, whatever that gang is, they're the ones that are causing problems right now. I've been going to meetings like this for years and years, and I don't think we're ever going to accomplish everything we want. But we can take care of the gang that's doing the problems right now. I think you've covered that, but my one question is loitering. I go down pain every day, and I look, and I look, and I look. And I want to know why, the, or if you can do something about people loitering, specifically across from U.S. Bank. Police go by, there's drug deals, I see it, I wanna take pictures with my phone, and the police drive by. That's what I want. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, a couple of issues, and the chief alluded to it earlier, uh, Chief Harrington and MC, MCTO police are working the bus stop issue, which is where a fair number of them hang out and the two stores that are on the west side of Payne are um, being looked at very closely by our, our uh, force unit because we believe that that's what's attracting them down to um, that corner. That, I just wanted to, eye contact, no, nope, that's fine. Um, and again, with the additional officers that the Chief's given me, um, effective started yesterday, I think you're gonna see a marked difference.
the 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 building above uh, the Verizon store and the. Okay, all right. Okay. City Attorney Sarah. I also wanted to add, my name is Sarah Gruing. I'm the city attorney. Uh, and together with John Steckman, who is a senior prosecutor in my office, the community prosecutor assigned to the east side. Uh, the other thing we're doing is aggressively, when we have specific cases come in, this morning we got someone ordered to stay off of all of Payne Avenue. So when there are cases that come in, John and the team are screening those for what's called stay away orders. Judge Millenacher this morning ordered someone to stay off Payne Avenue completely. Obviously that's a one, those are single instances, but we're, we're doing everything we can by the time they get to my office. Sarah. Hi, um, I just wanna say the victim's father is right behind me, so I hope you guys stay in here, what he has to say. I, and I feel really bad that I'm in front of him right now, but. Um, uh, my issue seems so small. I um, just noticed through the um, the sensors that Highland Park and Payne Phelan are nearly the same size, but we have almost as many kids aged 10 to 14 as Highland, MacRoveland, and West 7th combined. And I feel like we need more programming, even schools year round. Um, and then the 19-year-old that was charged, he lived in Dayton's Bluff, and the landlord had no clue that he was involved in an incident. And I don't know what the, the rights are for a landlord or you know, at what point do they know that there's a problem. Ma'am, thank you for those comments, and there are a lot of young, in fact, the meeting that we were in before this, discussing this with some other uh, very concerned community members. We had a meeting at four o'clock, and some of our also African-American leadership, we talked about how many young people live on the east side. Tremendous number, um, and versus how many rec centers, all the things that have been discussed tonight, more programming. That's why we've talked about and we've looked at very creative things like with the Youth Service Bureau and other things. You know, if we can keep the peace, then we don't have to throw as many people in jail because parents and other things, all the things that are being addressed tonight that I think the police department can't do all of that. We can't, it's a bigger social issue, but we get it and we work with all those partners. Um, on the landlord part, uh, of, of a suspect that was arrested, we, we don't have a process in place in the police department that, that we inform a landlord that someone's been arrested. Now, if someone calls us, we will tell them whether or not, if that's public information, and it is, once they're arrested, we would tell them that. But we don't call landlords uh, to let people know. Just I just wanted to answer that piece. Hello, I don't live in the neighborhood, but I'm speaking for my son who did, and um, I, I just want to commend all the public officials who's going over time here and listening to the people's concern. I want to thank everybody, the diverse um, opinions. I think everyone's voice matters. And um, I think everyone has to work together to make this a better world. And I really enjoy that you guys are working towards that. Um, I really don't. <laughs> And just don't stop. Just keep working towards something better. Um, the only thing I'd add that was, it wasn't brought up too much would maybe be more towards legislators is that maybe a little pay equity. I, th I think poverty has more to do with this than, than all these other issues that um, it, it's difficult to raise a child in today's world. And um, even middle class, being middle class myself, I struggle just to keep even. So. That would be my concern. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Russ. I've lived on the east side for about 35 years. And this is a very challenging place to raise kids. There's so much temptation and it seems that so often the negative people are able to continue doing what they're doing over and over again. My question is, mainly for the chief, 
and for Mr. Choi. It sounds like you're arresting a lot of people. Perhaps they're going to court. What's happening that these folks are not figuring it out? You know, you, we don't want to spin the wheel if we're not accomplishing. Public safety is important. No. You're absolutely right, sir. Thank you for that. Um, you know, when we make arrests and we present charges to the county or city attorney, the next process, obviously, when they charge a crime is to go through the criminal justice system um, with our bench and, and others. And so depending on what happens uh, to that individual, whether they're incarcerated or not, whether they have any kind of programming when they're incarcerated or not, or whether they're even incarcerated and get probation, that is something that after I'm, I'm, I'll um, defer to my partner here, John Choi, uh, that can talk a little more closely to that. But we present the facts. Um, there are times when all of us, including me, I'm a human, I live in St. Paul, get upset when I think a guy or someone that's committed a terrible crime should get more time than they do. And there are other times uh, they might get the amount of time that I think is, is relevant. Uh, but that is part of the larger criminal justice system. Uh, I agree with you, especially if they come out of prison and are they coming back into the same type of behavior that they were before. Uh, and we hope that they're not. But I'm going to turn this over to John Choi. Well, thank you for that question. I think it's an important one because, you know, oftentimes I think in the criminal justice system, it's uh, this giant assembly line and everybody's just doing their part and we're processing uh, cases. Uh, and sometimes as a, a prosecutor, you know, we have to ensure that there's a consequence uh, with respect to a crime. But I think there's another thing that we also have to be thinking about, and I think it's what you are talking about, is the outcome. Uh, to get uh, kids who are coming into the system, especially at an early age, to think about how we actually change that behavior. Because, uh, you know, we have to think about the fact that we do have a lot of, once someone comes into the system, we see repetition over and over again. And I do think that we are, we are doing some really creative and unique things. One of the things that we just recently did uh, with respect to uh, the expectations that we have with diversion providers, and this will echo the sentiment that's in this room, but a big part of it is for these kids, and I've spent a lot of time with some of these really at-risk kids, it's, it's connection to a loving and par a, a caring adult or a parent. And that's what's lacking for so many of these kids. And so with respect to some of the outcomes and the services that we want our diversion providers to achieve, we're asking diversion providers to think about that. Another thing, too, is getting that high school diploma. You, I mean, if you don't have a future in this economy, criminal behavior sounds like a pretty good thing. And so I really think we should have the expectation that all children ex graduate from high school. And our parents need to have that. So I also think that we're trying to get our, tr our um, diversion providers connected to the schools uh, to address the truancy issues, because education is the greatest equalizer in this country, and it, will, can, and it can lift up a community. Hi, my name is John, and I live on the east side of St. Paul. The last time we had a, such a loud, large turnout like this was when a woman was mugged over here on the east side of St. Paul by Lake Phelan. We had a big meeting there at the Phelan Park Recreation Center, which it wasn't large enough to hold all the people, just like this venue isn't large enough to hold all the people. At that time, Mr. Bostrom and Mr. Coleman were at that meeting, but they said the same words that you're saying right now. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this. Everything was all right for a little while. And things start to calm down again, then it was business as usual, nothing has changed. We gotta do something about this, nothing changes. Hi, I wonder if I could just comment uh, for just a moment. I'm Dan Bostrom and um, been a lifelong resident of this neighborhood. As a matter of fact, grew up just about a mile from here. 
And when I see this kind of stuff happening, it, it really troubles me because this is absolutely intolerable, should not happen. But you know, the facts of life are, folks, is there are some evil people out there on the street. And you know, you can have every intervention program you want under the sun for some of these kids, but unless you get the ringleaders off the street and away from them, we're never gonna be able to do anything with those kids. One of the things that the police strategy, and I, you know, I don't know everything about what's going on in the police department, but spent several years there myself, so I have a sense of how all this stuff operates. But one thing I know is that in the years gone by, the squads that are working the streets out here on the east side are running from call to call to call. I'll tell you that uh, 25 years ago, working on the east side was the best job you could get with the police department in the city of St. Paul. It was called Peaceful Valley. There were four squads that worked the entire east side on the midnight shift, and between them they may have gotten two or three calls. That was it. Things have really changed in the last few years. And what's going on now with this gang activity and so many calls to the police is that the squads are running and they simply don't have the time to do the proactive stuff. Now, what the chief has suggested and what I heard and we'll hold him to this, he said they're sending 30 officers over here as part of their force unit. The mounted patrol will be around, the bicycle patrol will be around, the motorcycles will be around, the traffic cars will be around. There's going to be a, a lot of police officers around here. And what that does, for some of the other comments I heard out there, that frees up the other district squads to be able to promptly respond to the other calls for assistance that they get, and also to do the patrolling down around the parks, and to do those kinds of things that need to be done. In conclusion, let me just talk about Phelan Park as long as that was brought up. Something significant happened with that whole Phelan Park issue. As a result of that, I worked with my colleagues on the council, Ms. Lantry for one, and we put aside over $100,000 and put up four closed circuit TV cameras around Lake Phelan. I'll not take any credit for the fact that there really haven't been any major problems around there since, but these bad guys do not want to be seen. And it was one of the best investments, in my opinion, that we ever made as far as the cost benefit for that. Phelan is going around the lake, it's, it's really a rather pleasant experience. One of the things we did just within a couple of blocks of this church, we put up closed circuit TV uh, cameras at Rose and Greenbrier, also over at Payne and Maryland, and also down at Case and Forest, as we have identified some of the hot spots in the area. And we've also appropriated the money to buy some more mobile cameras that we can put up as soon as we have some problems out there and the police officers determine, okay, this is where the trouble is. We'll get one of those mobile cameras out there and we're gonna do something about that right now. This kind of conduct from these troublemakers absolutely cannot be tolerated and it will not be tolerated. They're here, the cops are here. They're good guys, I've heard some comments about them tonight, but if you can't call them, who in the world you're gonna call that's gonna protect us? Those guys are good, those women are good, they do a heck of a job, and I thank them. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Steve Cobb, I'm a member of this community, and there's a few things um, that were brought up before me that really met the mark in terms of solving the problem. Um, People can complain with the police and shoot, you know, throw darts at the police. But at the same time, I've met with some of the members, some of the chiefs, the commanders that are at this table about teen issues, and they do care. And they did stay overtime at a church I was at once, and they do want to solve the problem. But I think, you know, locking kids up, you can continue to lock kids up and put them on that pipeline to prison. But at the same time, if we don't solve the root problem of it, then there's a constant factory manufacturing kids. Because these kids, you mentioned evil, these kids weren't born evil. They weren't babies and two-year-olds evil. So they were socialized to be that way. So if we don't solve, and since the entertainment industry and 
other areas aren't on our side, aren't really on the community or school side in terms of bringing up young people. We have to kind of look at what we can do ourselves. You can take kids to court. You can charge them. They're out. Some kids who, and I know for Okay, I'd like to have, I'd like to have a voice like the last man. I have to get that just for we're, equity. We're doing time. Okay, so I'm saying that you can lock different kids up, but what happens is they're continuing to be created, and who needs to be in terms of solutions? Who needs to be empowered to handle the kids if you're not culturally competent to be able to deprogram? These kids, because I, I heard about the racial incident, and I see that point, because it was a bunch of black kids. But if I had to walk down that alley or that street past those teens, I might have got jumped on too. So you could take that. But what I'm saying is that <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is I have to finish my like the last one. Yeah, I, I bet you, and be polite to each other. I'm gonna say it's not fair. Let him finish. Oh my God, he should be able to speak. That's true. And for that to have happened is possibly. Well, we have a one minute. We said one minute. Let him finish. You didn't enforce it. See, when you don't keep that precedent, okay, I'm going to keep it short. But when people, like, when people commit serious crimes and you see them back out on the street, it gets very frustrating for the officers and for the officials in the courtroom. So back to who should be able to deprogram these kids since they were not born that way is the community leaders who know the kids, who are able to say, you know, by you creating that crime and being involved in crime and hurting that young man who went to the hospital, that justifies other people to now conceal and carry. Because do you think that any family members now, do you know how many family members now are gonna conceal and carry because they don't wanna walk by a dangerous crowd? But what the young people don't understand in conclusion, what the young people don't understand is that that kind of crime and involvement now justify, gives people the justification to say, I'm going to start packing weapons. And so with that, we need to empower community leaders who can get to the kids and the kingpins. If you could take the kingpins off the street, but get to the, the followers and the wannabes, and those black people that are community leaders and upstanding citizens are best qualified through programs to deprogram them, because they are out of control, and it is a serious problem that all of us are need to be concerned about. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next question. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Jacobson. We have a ministry on geranium and pain, and we came here to help with uh, the problem that this gentleman and others have identified with the younger children, and we're going to do what we can there. But I've got a question for the, uh, the county and city attorney about being more proactive with the gangs that uh, seem to be causing most of the problems. Aren't there RICO uh, statutes or some other law that you can uh, get into and, and nail these guys before they beat somebody up? Well, there are lots of tools uh, that are available, and um, the chief and from the law enforcement, city attorney, county attorney, we're looking at all of those. And so I just assure you, I can't talk about some of the things that are active, but um, uh, just uh, please be assured that uh, uh, we are leaving no stone unturned. Uh, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, the east side means a lot to all of us up here. I guess I get to be the last one. Mr. Greg Sokowski, I grew up on the east side of St. Paul. I'm a behavior performance analyst, grew up on the east side. I speak and train around the country in high schools and colleges, the NFL, NHL, and even out of the country. I'm going to take a different perspective. You can put a cop on every corner. And as the policeman will tell you, if somebody's going to get you and cause trouble, they're going to do it. It's not about the police. What it is, is about all of us coming together. There's an old saying. There's an old saying. If you're not part of the problem, you're part of the, not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Everybody in this room. Keep your yards looking better. When you see kids smarting out, stand tall. 
We've allowed this to happen and we're all guilty of it, whether it be through how we voted, how we've done things. Support local businesses. When local businesses go out because we want to support the Outbacks, the McDonald's, the local guys go and then we have an empty Payne Avenue. Another thing too, take pride in how you dress. Talk to these kids. As I said, we have put on so many programs, the money is not the issue. The parents don't support the programs. School board meetings are coming up. There are camps, there are clinics. You need to support the discipline of the teachers and so forth. So all I'm saying is, it's a different aspect. Last comment. The state fair this year, the state fair this year for the first time in history could not fill their positions. They had more than enough applications. It's the work ethic that we have that we need to improve with kids and adults. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate uh, Mr. Revore. Go ahead, Mr. Rivor. Yes, I want to know is when you report a crime, how come when you go down and they make an arrest and you go down to the police station and the, everything about the criminal is crossed out but your name's on top? Don't you think that's kind of dangerous to have something like that? When your name is on it, it happened twice with our name. It's on the top of the list and the criminal confronted my wife. He went to court, he stole a bobcat, he had, he had it on his truck and everything. And he, she was walking down the alley, he confronted her. What? I think we have your question, Mr. Okay. Revore. I want to know the answer. Why yeah. do you put uh, people that are trying to help you as the bad guy? Because it's dangerous, that criminal is going to see it. Well, sir, I don't know exactly the, the case you're talking about, but um, if, if you request to be non-public, that should never be public, and I don't know exactly the specific case, but uh, as far as the other data that we do release, it's all governed by state law uh, as far as public information goes. So if, if you'd like to give us the information on that case, we will certainly call you back and find out, and I apologize that that happened to you. Okay, we'll, we'll look into it for you, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Again, I want to uh, thank our panel for being here. Uh, you've stayed uh, longer than you had committed to stay, and I appreciate your being here. I hope that people will turn in your questions to staff if you have them. Thank you to the elected people who uh, were here tonight. Uh, and this is really just the beginning. We need to continue to work on this. We need to have not only the police involved, but youth serving organizations. So thank you for being here and thank you for continuing to work on this project. Thank you very much.